introduction to the water efficiency rating score. This course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, GBCI, AIA, HSW, uh, certified green professional, AIBD, and may be approved for your state-based contractor or design license. I'm your host and moderator today. My name is Brett Little, and I'm the executive director here at the Green Home Institute. Green Home Institute is a nonprofit celebrating 15 years this year. We exist to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. We want to thank our Platinum Plus sponsor, Anderson Windows, for allowing us to uh, be able to do these kinds of sessions, as well as our 2015 sponsors, Cake Systems, Certainty, Panasonic, Warmboard, and Black Locust Lumber USA. Do you support greener homes? Sign up to become a member today. Help keep these sessions going. Uh, get discounts on in-person and other um, webinar events, discounts on green certification costs, as well as other benefits for becoming a member. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce our speaker today, uh, Laureen, uh, Laureen Blissard. Uh, she holds a master's degree in architecture from the University of Illinois and has built a successful 20-plus year practice in design and construction of buildings and interiors. She is also a licensed architect in Illinois and Wisconsin, as well, in, as well as having received approval for reciprocal licensure designation in every state except California via NC NCARB certification. She's a founding member and past chair of the Illinois chapter of the U.S. Building Council and currently serves in the chapter's governance committee as well as the Residential Green Building Advocate. Um, that entails numerous public speaking engagements on behalf of the chapter. Additionally, she is also the principal and owner of LTLB Envirotexture, a small architecture and design firm that primarily focuses on green building program certified projects, existing home retrofits for aging in place clients. So with that, uh, Lorraine, take it away. All right. Can you hear me pretty well out there? Or? Yes? No? Yep. Yeah, okay. sound great. Yeah. That, uh, thanks for the the uh, intro, Brett, it's a little little old. I've actually retired from USGBC, so, and um, currently enjoying also being the uh, technical director for the Green Builder Coalition, which is the primary um, entity that is shepherding this development of the um, of the WERS. So, with that, we'll just go ahead and start off with the slides. I'm going to do these pretty quick, just so that we have time for questions. We we only have an hour, right, Brett? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, so the Green Builder Coalition, we're a national nonprofit membership organization, and you know, we run the gamut, individuals primarily, not companies. And our goal isn't necessarily to endorse any green building program, and you know, specifically, it's really more just to assist with green practices and strategies. Uh, learning objectives today, we're trying to go beyond only energy and taking a look at water being important. Um, even in water-rich states, just like here in Illinois, uh, where I'm based, many people think we've got Lake Michigan, so we can be as wasteful with water as we want, which is not true. Um, also, just to give you an idea of what the scope of worse would be, and the possibilities of it applying to both new and existing homes. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's frog in my throat. Um, and then also to show that we are looking at a predictive model, not necessarily a, um, a prescriptive. Oh, someone says they're having issues with audio. Um, still having problems? That, that's fine, Lorraine. Don't repeat that. Okay. We'll just we'll move forward. Thank okay. you. Okay, no problem. And then also just what the benefit of the program could possibly be. We've been working with several water districts in the southwest and trying to figure out ways to help analyze, and using a tool, analyze what potential impacts would be for additional infrastructure or current infrastructure. So what's the problem? Well, I think it's pretty apparent with what's been going on out in California that there's an issue. and Right now, the Government Accountability Office is looking at perhaps 40 states are likely to experience water shortages in the next 10 years. And if we continue to just ignore this problem, it's not going to go away. 
I mean, there's so many things. I mean, you can't live without water, you know. Maybe live without food for a little while, but definitely not without water. Um, and then, of course, Governor Brown in California issued uh, last or this year a um, water restriction, mandatory water restrictions to, to reduce by you know 25 percent. And you know that that's that's quite a bit. Whether or not that's uh, actually happening or they're being successful is another. Um, and so the drought monitor definitely. Right now, California is being hit, but several other areas, Pacific Northwest even, and uh, Texas. And you can actually track that yourself if you're interested at um, Drought Monitor. There's the address at the bottom. Also, there's many, many, many withdrawals. And you're looking at all the possibilities at this point in terms of water usage. And it's not just necessarily you know, domestic. We've got agriculture, we've got industrial, and even for power generation. And then also the groundwater. The uh, Ogallawa, I, can't, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, aquifer is this big guy right here. And all of these states basically tap into it. And you saw the drought picture. I mean, Texas is in a severe drought in some places, and they're tapping into that. So it's just only a matter of time before everyone else is affected that uh, uses that aquifer. And then uh, other issues that occur, we can get saltwater intrusion. Um, and then as far as surface water withdrawals, again, I, this blew me away, this whole power generating. Um, so there's definitely a water energy nexus. And then withdrawal surface to ground. And again, we're looking at California in both cases being very, very, very um, high usage. And then domestic water projections in uh, the southwest, of course. And we need to definitely make a um, proper comparisons between population growth and water usage. You know, for example, like the New Mexico population is currently declining, but that doesn't mean the water usage will. You know, we already saw that um, electro generation and industrial also use water. So there's so many different things that, that impact that resource. And then the prices vary all across the board. I know here in uh, Naperville, where I'm actually based, it's about four to five dollars per thousand gallons, where, you know, on the West Coast maybe it's a little higher. And then also we have quite a bit of waste that happens just from leaks. With uh, replacing faucets and aerators, of course, that helps as well, but really what is that impact? We don't really know unless there's a way to actually measure that impact. And then, of course, uh, irrigation. I don't know about you, but it really bothers me when I'm driving around and it's either um, pouring heavily and you see these irrigation systems running or the heads aren't properly installed and the sidewalk's getting watered or the driveway's getting watered. So definitely. But doesn't that make the concrete grow better, Lorraine? <laughs> oh, I think, <laughs> I think it increases its re reflectivity, you know, reduces heat island effect. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, I just 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 adore it. Um, so we were approached by the um, Santa Fe Area Home Builders Association and some folks on the conservation committee almost two years ago, and they are were looking for a way to measure the usage or potential usage or predictive usage because they're and specifically Santa Fe, ties their permitting process to water reduction strategies. So yes, you can do all these prescriptive things, but without really knowing what the measurement would be, how do you really know what the impact is? And so that's part of the evolution of where this, um, where this came from. And uh, of course, we've got stormwater challenges too. 
you know, infrastructure is aging. And Chicago is a, a big one where we have uh, combined rain and um, sewer. So whenever there was a heavy rainfall, the system was so heavily impacted, it just couldn't handle the the onslaught. And of course, people ended up with sewage in their basements. Of course, they've taken measures with um, with other projects that have helped to reduce some of those issues. Um, also, many uh, wastewater treatment facilities are at maximum capacity. Now, that's another issue. We already talked about the aquifers shrinking. Um, excess, excessive stormwater runoff management is also inconsistent, and it's not necessarily enforced in all jurisdictions. And then, you know, customers really do want to know how much water they're using. And in some cases, uh, a home's water costs and sewage costs are based on how much water is taken in. So it's, it's really a complex problem. And then we've got issues with uh, elaborate systems to transport water. You know, that's an inherent wasteful use of energy and money. And I know on the East Coast, they're definitely looking at ways of keeping as much storm water on a property as possible, of course, just to reduce infrastructure impacts. But they're, they have that concern of pollution and, and uh, runoff. All right. so. Let's see. Oh, we're doing pretty good. I smoked through those. Um, we're going to switch over to my screen and talk a little bit about the program itself. Just to kind of couch it or a little bit of a disclaimer, right now it's in a uh, Excel spreadsheet format, which is not the ideal. And the intent is to eventually have it all be web-based. And of course, there would be an app that could be downloaded. Um, the other intent is and I'm just assuming everyone here is familiar with REMRATE to some extent. There are two versions of that program. One is a way for design teams to just input and do some quick analysis. And then the other is what the verifier, the HERS rater, would actually use. And so the intent eventually is to have two versions of this program. And I don't mean. Um, entirely different, but there are just some things that are irrelevant to uh, a design team or a builder or architect, designer, or whomever. Um, as they're going through the process, those kinds of things would be irrelevant to them, but not to the verifier. So what I'm going to be showing you currently is the spreadsheet as a verifier would, would be using it. And well, let's see if we got this technology is going to work. And while you're setting that up, Larry, in, in case there is anybody who's wondering what the REM rate is, just just to make sure that, that you know you have that covered, um, it's a basically a, a design tool that uh, uh, verification tool that um, a rater, a trained and accredited um, home energy rater, would utilize to generate a HERS index rating, uh, basically, which is a miles per gallon label typically being used on a third of all new construction homes and multifamily low-rise buildings at this point in time. Um, so that, I mean, if you're, if you're not sure what the HERS index is, you can go to, um, um, uh, where am I thinking here? Um, uh, uh, ResNet, that's it, yeah, ResNet.org, um, R-E-S-E-N-T. Um, and you can learn a little bit more about um, what that tool is um, if you're unsure of it. Yep, no problem. And just to let you know, Brett, I, I lost my little chat thing, so I wouldn't be able to see any questions anyway at the moment. Oh, OK, that's fine. I'll be watching. OK, cool. All right. So just to kind of start out, we're, I put a couple items in ahead of time just to help facilitate getting through this in the time that we have. But as you're filling this out, the idea would be in the background when it eventually becomes an app, that you begin th putting things into the database that both, uh, and, it, and again, this depends on how you start your project. If it's going to be the verifier that begins it from, um, from you know, before construction or however you know, the sequence ends up working, or if it's the builder team, it, it wouldn't make any difference. It just, there might be different screen inputs. Um, but for now, with the way that it works, you would, have to select the state within which you're located. And I think we've got, yeah, we've got New Mexico in here now. 
And then we've created these rain regions based on the International Water Management Institute maps for the time being. The intent would eventually be that you would just put your zip code in and then the entire system would become populated with the, the data, the water data that's applicable to that um, zip code. Um, just a little housekeeping, if you will. If there's anything in a white box that would typically require a response from the person filling it out, orange boxes are pull downs, as I showed you here. And if it's a purple box with white text, or if it's a gray box, no action is needed. Um, typically, these purple boxes with white in them are just showing that there's data in the system. So for instance, if we were taking a look at here's your average annual rainfall for um, that rain region that was selected, but if we selected another one, that information will then change accordingly for that area, just so that you can see that yes, that it is everything is working in the background. Now for this, um, run through, we're going to take a look at a new single home. And it's approximately 2,000 square feet. So this information is important to collect, especially if you're going to do any kind of rainwater harvesting and or landscaping. And then the next thing that we'll want to collect is what the roof type is. And this affects how quickly the runoff uh, comes off the roof if you're doing any kind of rainwater collection. And the other thing that we'd want to collect is the number of bedrooms, floors, average floor height. The number of bedrooms, just to keep in mind, is how we calculate an, an occupancy. And the standard that we have drawn from is the ASHRAE 62 standard, where you essentially take the number of bedrooms and add one, and that would be your occupancy. Now keep in mind, this is a predictive model. It's just a snapshot in time of the property. So there's no way really to account for if there's two people living in a four-bedroom home or eight people living in a four-bedroom home. It's just a snapshot, like I said, in time. Uh, the other things that you want to collect are what your potential distance, if this is a proposed analysis, uh, what your potential distance from the water heater to the master bath shower would be, and then to the kitchen sink. And this is what we use to calculate what the potential structural waste would be. And that's when you turn on your shower and you're waiting for hot water to come through. All that water is wasted, so that's considered structural waste. Uh, the climate information, of course, is automatically populated. The next thing that you'll want to put in is what your approximate lot size is and if there's any encroachments. And these are areas that you can't legally build or landscape in. Um, again, what's under roof, because the footprint may not be the same as uh, what's actually under roof. You could possibly have a garage or a shed or something along those lines. And you'll want that deducted. And so then the next number we want to focus on is what happens to this 5,500 square feet that's left behind. Um, just a quick aside, these percentages here were requested by a couple piloters on the East Coast because they limit the amount of irrigation and landscaping either by percent or by square footage. And so let's say hypothetically you, there's a 50% landscape reduction, then that's the amount of uh, square footage that would need to be addressed down in our collection infiltration and land use worksheet. But that's pretty much the only place that uses it is Florida and um, Georgia, South Carolina. Now, we've got to figure out what's going to happen with that 5,500 square feet. So what typically will happen is you'll have a driveway. So that's what your impervious would be. Um, it, you could potentially have directed impervious paving. And this is if you're going to be doing any kind of collection off of your sidewalks and your driveway for any kind of irrigation. Some municipalities don't necessarily allow this. so. That might be a red flag for a verifier just to make sure that either it, was, it wasn't filled out correctly or that they're trying to claim you know, a design feature that doesn't exist. Um, so back to this 5,500 square feet, we're going to attribute um, 4,500 to new softscapes. So that's, that could be anything. That could be gravel. It could be trees. It could be grass. Well, actually, no, grass is up here. I'm sorry. Uh, shrubs, hydrozoned flower beds, you know, that sort of thing. And then water features could be pools or spas or fountains, that sort of thing. 
And then once you get down to the bottom, it, everything should match up. Because what will happen is if there's any kind of imbalance, the system will tell you that uh, it needs to be corrected. So this 5,000 square feet that's left, this now becomes part of that exterior use uh, WERS. So just to keep in mind, the indoor use WERS and the exterior use WERS are just subtotals. That isn't a final, and you can't get an official WERS without looking at both those numbers. And the final score on the WERS report actually looks at the combined baseline of indoor and outdoor water in comparison to combined usage of indoor and outdoor water. So with that, I'm just going to pop over to the indoor. So on here, you need to input what the proposed units are going to be for all of your fixtures. The other thing you need to do is make sure that uh, if it's applicable to the project to indicate it as such. The only reason that these are put here is sometimes a builder will build a home and it's a spec home and there won't be a washer included. So there'll need to be an accounting of it somehow. Either there's actually one there or there isn't. So in this um, example, we're not going to put one in. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and put in some potential units real quick. And then for um, dishwashers, you definitely need to put in um, what the gallons per cycle are. I know some folks, unless you don't have a dishwasher, I actually know some people who don't have them and they like to wash their dishes by hand, which is great. Lorraine, does that help your score if you don't have one? Um, possibly. Possibly. We haven't actually run that through yet. Or maybe I should say hurt your score <laughs> if you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there's, there's nothing calculated unless you actually have it in the, in the program, if that makes sense. All right. Um, now, just keep in mind, based on what you input on the floor heights and the distance from the water heater and that sort of thing, you are getting a predicted um, structural waste of uh, approximately three quarters of a gallon from your furthest fixture, which, you know, hypothetically, we're basically telling the system that this is a very, very uh, efficiently planned home. Uh, all the, you know, the furthest fixture from the um, water heater is only 20 feet, which, which is, is amazing. In fact, it's a water heater that's probably just right underneath it. Um, anyway, when you actually have it verified, when you go out and do your, your measurement, you would put in the, the true amount, and then that would override whatever the predicted structural waste would be. And we've, we've seen um, numbers that are, are fairly close. So if it comes up 0.79 on the prediction that the actual might actually, uh, or the, the verified actual would be you know, not too far off. Um, of course, it could vary if there's a research pump and that sort of stuff. All right, so that being said, we've got our um, items in here. If there is the possibility that you can have different flows of fixtures, which does happen on occasion, say hypothetically you have a double head shower, um, they would count um, in each stall. So if you have two that are one and a half, then it would be three gallons per minute. And then let, let's say there's two other bathrooms, hypothetically, and they run at, um, Let's see, let's say point seven five. Then this average is what gets put up into the uh, the water use for the shower head so that the system will account for um, for those differences. And it's not a true average, so you wouldn't necessarily be adding um, if you do a quick math here, you know one and a half and three. Uh, divided by three is not 1.65. Okay, so that's that's put in. Um, other things that we can account for is if there's, say, a humidifier, which could happen in in uh, New Mexico, um, quite possibly, and there's a gallon per day usage of maybe three, then that will also get accounted for in the system. 
under indoor water features and gallons per day. But you just have to activate it. All right. So far, we're looking at 68 for our score subtotal. But just like with solar panels and the energy rating programs like Energy Gauge and um, REM rate, you can offset your indoor usage with any kind of rainwater or gray water collection. You just need to tell the system if you're going to do that or how you're going to do that. So this is probably the more complicated aspect of the worksheet. And there's quite a few things on here that are probably more applicable to a verifier than to the average user. So we're going to, for this example, we're going to go ahead and collect rainwater and use it. And we'll collect approximately 80%. And so right off the bat, you'll get an average available per month, but you'll also be shown um, monthly what's actually available. And so some water calculating programs out there will just focus on this average and use it for everything. But as you can see, that's not truly what's going on. And the other is actually considering watering months. So in uh, Santa Fe, you're not going to be watering in a handful of these months because it's freezing. You're going to be shutting down all of your systems. Um, the other thing that you might want to consider, I know here in Illinois, gray water capture is, is a tough nut to crack, and you usually have to get variances. But uh, in New Mexico, they really make it easy. Um, and so right now, with all the input that we've received, the only places that we're allowed to collect are labs, shower tub, and washer. You know, all the other items would be a little bit more difficult at this time. So for the sake of getting this version out, we, we just concentrated on these three items. So what you would need to do is just tell the system you know, where you're going to be collecting water from. Um, and then there's a quick button. That's what these alls are. Because um, even though you might say yes here, when you select all, it just overrides that and basically does that, selects all. So now that we've decided, OK, we're going to capture from where we're going to capture, we need to tell the system how we're going to use it. And the plan, of course, was to reuse the rainwater. But in order to use it indoors, there would have to be filtration. Otherwise, it'll only be allowed for outdoor. And then you just need to tell the system what your plan is. So these little, these little flags, no indoor rainwater capture use selected, means you just have to come down here and say, all right, yes, I'm going to use rainwater in my kitchen sink, and I'm going to use for my labs. But then you'll notice that there isn't enough water. So for this example, we only have enough to use for the kitchen sink. So even if we were to do the all override, it wouldn't matter. I mean, there's just not enough to do all of them. And that's just another way to kind of see where your demands um, fall within your house. OK. So yep. And then also there's a, um, uh, a safety net. So even though there was a little bit of water left when we did the kitchen sink by itself, and even though it looks like it's probable that it would be OK, there still has to be a little bit left in the tank for maintenance. And this is pretty typical um, according to ARCSA, which is one of the organizations with which we worked in developing um, a tank sizing program. Uh, because further on in the, in the spreadsheet here, the system actually sizes that, that for you. Uh, so we can tool around with this until you actually find something that gets fairly close to what your demands might be. I'll see that might be a little bit better is use the use it for the toilets. And then whatever's remaining would then be considered for outdoor. Now if we're going to reuse gray water, it's the same situation. You just have to tell it, are you going to use it indoors, outdoors? If you're going to use it indoors, you have to have filtration. Now because we've already selected the toilet up here, it can't be selected down here because you wouldn't necessarily mix those two types of water, at least not in this program. And we haven't encountered that as of yet. 
So right now the piping's all separate and everything is um, considered separate. So I don't know about you, but hey, we could take a shower using captured gray water if it's filtered and purified. And then you get your tank sizes as well. So you'd have to have at least a 1,500 gallon tank to accomplish this usage. And this one would have to be a little bit bigger. And then, like I said, these are verifier notifications. So the typical planner wouldn't have these kinds of switches. It would just be more or less, OK, yeah, I need this size tank. And uh, then they'd move on. And at the bottom, we get a summary as to what's available for outdoors once we've decided, OK, yeah, we're going to be using all these things um, indoor for uh, Let's see, what did we do? We did the toilet and the shower and tub. Oh, and the other thing we need to do is tell the system what's going on with the rest of the gray water. So we're going to go ahead and say, hey, it's irrigation. So that way it gets accounted for in the offset. Now just to show real quick, we've gone through that computation. This flag goes away, but now you can see how the system is being offset. I think we were, we were at 68 before or 63, and now we've, we've dropped considerably on the subtotal because we've offset with our capture and usage. So I'm going to hop over to exterior use now because we've got to tell the system what's going on with this 5,000 square feet. And now this comes from the front on that start here where you told the system what you're doing with, <coughs> with the uh, remaining land, landscape or whatever. And so we've got 45 100 square feet here and 5,000, which has to be accounted for under the exterior use. Again, all these purple boxes are just informational. So here we've got 4,500 square feet in one area and 5,000 in the other. Now, obviously, we're not going to be planting any plants in this water feature, so you just need to tell the system that it's a pool or spa. And there is some accounting for water usage for evaporation and refill. Um, and this other 4,500, let's say hypothetically, um, it's New Mexico, and they decided, hey, we're not going to do anything but gravel, which is fine. And that does happen. And so now this is our average water need per month, but that's not necessarily true, again, because it's calculated over the um, every month separately. But this is just to show you that the system is working and calculating in the background. So towards the bottom, what we find is that this would be, the 11 would be the subtotal without using the rainwater and gray water from the previous tab. And so now we're getting closer to that nice little zero number. But of course, the four that is here on the exterior and the 34 that's here on the indoor are not added together and then averaged. Um, what's, what, as I said before, what's actually going on in the background, the baseline water use for indoor and outdoor is combined and then compared against the um, indoor and outdoor actual use. So when we get to the report at the end, because we put some dollar amounts on the uh, per thousand, we'll actually get a nice little report as to what the savings per year could possibly be. Now granted, I think, what do I have there? Oh yeah, that's, that's just way too low. <laughs> um, so here the, the savings would be quite a bit more on indoor use. 400 or so. And remember, on the irrigation side, or the outdoor use, we were seeing that 50% of water is typically wasted. But you can almost see $1,000 savings, and then combine about 1400 a year, which is not too shabby. And then your final score would be the 14, because you're using the offsets, and you actually take in, um, or, and you've actually notified the program that that was your intent. And then there's a nice little diagram that just shows you where that distribution actually occurs in terms of your use per the baseline. And then the very last tab, this verification summary, um, 
it's somewhat outside of WERS. It doesn't actually affect the score because many of these items were requested by many of the different piloters we were working with as well as municipalities that are looking at integrating this with code. In fact, that's what Santa Fe has done. Um, but because they're not measurable and there isn't any empirical data or a white paper that could actually prove what the possible impact would be, it's not included in WERS at this time. However, Santa Fe is a primary example. They wanted to be able to at least award a applicant for a permit um, some type of points. So if, and, and in this instance, they're, they ask for a five-point minimum in each category for indoor efficiency practices and then as well as outdoor. But seeing as this particular example, we've gone through and done a um, outdoor calc, there can easily be a, you know, a four-point award right there because they've gone through the pro process of actually figuring out what their exterior water use is. So, you know, there are just some things here that, again, they just don't make sense having them as a part of the WERS until we can actually prove, you know, that any of these things will have a measurable impact. You know, for instance, um, let's see, like here, a gray water stub out is installed. Well, that's not really going to impact any be any kind of impact on a score. So again, these are just um, items that are requests for, like I said, municipalities and um, other piloters, just, just to kind of get it in the background or in the mind of the designers that, um, hey, here's some other things that we could possibly do, even though they don't necessarily have a direct impact, but they are possible items that um, could affect other green building programs, like for instance, you know, if you've got excess water flow shut off, that could be a durability thing or leak detection systems, you know, those, those types of items. But um, mainly the WERS itself, the water efficiency rating score, is just these first five tabs. And so with that, I'll go back to the slide deck, I hope. <laughs> Uh, now you're there. Yep, you're there. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful. Oh, it still wants to share it. Oh, there we go. Got it. Beautiful. All right. So the benefits of this, we talked a little bit about this before. You know, we can we have the potential for financial incentives, reducing tap and stormwater impact fees. Uh, potential tax credits right now. There's a Senate bill in New Mexico and it's approved and being funded. Um, also Santa Fe has incorporated this as their code, so it is a part of their permit process. Right now they are going through um, a bunch of different pilots as well as uh, examples just to kind of see what that score needs to be because right now with their permitting process uh, they require a HERS index of 70 in order to get a permit, and so now they're trying to figure out, well, what WERS do we need to have, you know, what, what is a reasonable WERS in order to an award a, a permit. Um, also, of course, long-term conservation of press, precious and essential resource. And we've recently won an award from Santa Fe. Our, our team was um, on hand to pick that up just because, again, helping Santa Fe with their goals, their sustainability goals, as well as water conservation planning. Um, was, of course, we were recognized for that. And then partnerships that we have right now, um, of course, e Evolve, that's a thermostatic valve that's put on the shower. Essentially, you can um, start the water, and by the time it gets warm, it shuts off the valve until it's down to a trickle so that when you're finally ready for your shower, um, you're not wasting any more water. And of course, uh, Rocchio is a, is a good group. We've been working with them on um, controllers, irrigation controllers. And they also collect weather data down to, um, you know, the block, if you will. Of course, I, we think zip code is, is good enough. <laughs> Don't think we want to throw in um, weather data for every address on the planet. And then, of course, Santa Fe Area Home Builders Association in the city of Santa Fe can't, um, 
can't go by without mentioning them. And we've also been working heavily with uh, Jonah Shine over at WaterSense in helping put, uh, put together some of these things. Uh, we've got this uh, webinar today, but there's a couple other ones coming up that will essentially go through what we did today. So if anybody wants a refresher, feel free to um, send an email to info at Green Builder Coalition. And we also have training coming up for those who are interested in becoming either trainers or verifiers. So we're targeting uh, February of 2016. And again, just send an uh, email over to info at Green Builder Coalition if you're interested. And now to questions. Thanks, Lorene. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you great. great. There was just a little a uh, lively debate, a uh, very interesting debate, and I'd like to kind of, I'd like to come back to it. Uh, not really a debate; it was more of just general conversation, and this idea that um, um, having a dishwasher statistically is going to save more water um, than than hand washing. So, I, I guess coming back to that, um, to what degree uh, is WERS going to recognize that, or is there something in the works to to recognize that? Well, it. it it does, in essence, um, trying to think off the top of my head what the, the rate is. There, there's a certain number of uses per person and duration that's automatically built into it, but it's not necessarily going to account for behavior. You know, uh, there's no way of actually measuring, uh, I mean, these are just average, um, like say, for instance, showers would be a perfect example. Um, this information was provided to us by EPA based on some white papers that they had put together as well as some research they had done that, you know, an average shower is X and it's this duration and these many times a day, that sort of stuff. There's no way to account for someone that likes to take an hour shower. I mean, I've got friends with teenagers that, you know, they're in there forever. So there's no real way to pick up on um, behavior, you know, and as to whether washing dishes by hand or dishwasher, I mean, preference is to actually put in as much information as you can. And typically, it's it's very rare that I encounter a project that doesn't have a dishwasher outside of maybe um, Habitat for Humanity. But uh, like I said, there there is some accounting for sink use. It's just probably not um, to the level of intent or uh, level or, um, I'm trying to think, <sighs> how to, without actually opening up the program and showing you the logarithms going, or algorithms going on in the background. Um, so there, there is a multiplier and there is an accounting for, for usage per person, you know, whether or not that's hand washing, whether or not that's dishwashing, or whether or not that's, you know, using a dishwasher or not, because there are some people who have dishwashers and they barely use them because there's not enough people and they hand wash anyway. So we, we try to capture as much as we could in the algorithm. Sure. Yep. If that, if that answers your question. Yeah, I, I don't think we have to go too in, too in detail. I think, I think that's perfect. I think it was just, um, just trying to get more of a sense of how that it's accounted for and, and um, you know, we don't, we don't have to, we don't have to dive into the math of it though. So. Um, and there's some other questions here piling in, so you know, let's make sure we can get to some of oh, these. Yeah. Um, I know we've got a handful of minutes here. Let's see, the next one I think... Um, uh, I see it right here. There's a lot of stuff going on. So, um, so the other one is, I, I guess, and let me just reword this question because others might be thinking this, but uh, to what degree can this tool be used um, or, or plan on being used on anything, other types of buildings outside of just single family homes? Ah, yes, um, that is the plan. Um, let's see if I can share my screen again. Whoa. Okay. There we go. All right, so on the Start Here tab at the front, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of time. I'm not going to go in and do an example, but there is the option to look at multifamily, uh, multiple homes and hospitality. There's also the ability to look at existing. Um, and this is more or less just to compare uh, before you make any changes. So the existing home has all, you know, 
these different flows versus what the potential changes are and potential impact. If you are doing an analysis of a uh, Green Star a home, I think one of the folks had a question on this off the top of my head, where they ran it through as existing because the home was already built. What I would suggest is treat it as new because um, this existing for right now is really set up to do a comparison between um, how a snapshot of how a home is right then and there versus where it's going to be with the changes or where it is after it's been built, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, mentioned existing because we do uh, are hoping to have this more involved in the renovation and remodeling or addition process. Um, what, is there any other things people would need to know about the tool that's different if you activate the existing? Yeah, it activates the column um, for existing units. So let's say hypothetically you've got a three gallon per flush toilet, which does happen and I've encountered that. Um, and let's see, we've turned off the washer. But it will definitely calculate that and show you there is a potential to have a, a worse subtotal over 100 and then what the potential, you know, lowering would be based on the offsets and then changing out the fixtures. You could, tech, you could if you wanted to, use this um, spreadsheet as it is right now and just compare toilet to toilet just what the the water usage change would be if you cleared everything out and just looked at an existing toilet versus the one, let's say you're, you've got an, a horrible one that does six gallons per flush, I've actually seen that, um, and you just want to see what the impact would be on your water usage by just going to a du dual flush, you know, you can do that too. Um, and then back to the original question on multifamily and that sort of thing, multiple homes. So the intent is to have the ability to put the number of, of units total and then the sample size and then have the WERS report reflect what that potential impact would be. Um, of course, right now I've got it set to existing single home, so that WERS report is going to reflect what the changes are um, based on where the house was existing before you made all those improvements. So I, th I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and just to confirm too, you said um, so there is multifamily, there is hospitality, and, and there is a goal to build this out for other types of building usage? Uh, eventually, eventually. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, any other questions? Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, here's a question. Does WERS scoring recognize rainwater harvesting? but recharged into the water table? Ah, actually it does. Um, well, maybe not, maybe the word isn't recharged. A direct injection, I'm hoping that that's what you mean as well. Um, maybe, maybe not, but yes, there is on the capture and usage tab the ability to tell the system what you're going to do with your, with your leftover gray water. Is it going to be um, for irrigation or for direct injection, which I guess is pretty popular in, in um, New Mexico and some of the southwestern states. They just put it right into the ground. So, Yeah, if there's any further comment on that, feel free to drop that in there again. Um, so the next question is just about, and I think you kind of answered this a little bit, um, but where is the words at as far as draft? Is this version 1.0? And what is the processes, um, process in place for changes and updates? Right. So for right now, um, yep, this is essentially where, uh, where's version 1. The process for changes and updates, we have a technical committee that we're working with all the piloters and we do want the feedback, definitely want the feedback and we've received quite a bit as to what changes need to happen. The thing that's tough is right now it's an Excel spreadsheet, but what would be preferable, of course, would have it uh, be available online or as an app. And so there might be some changes that happen um, from the spreadsheet to that issuing of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. I'm just, um, uh, so, uh, yeah, as we're going through this, everyone, feel free to 
we got still some more time for some more questions. But here's a big question, and and I, I, I kind of want to field this one um, first, Lorena, and then I would love to have you uh, interject into that because we've been getting, and I've been getting this question a lot um, on both the energy side and, and now the water side. And mm -hmm. we're even looking at this question in regards to the, the, the redevelopment or improvement of the Green Star Home Certification Tool in general. And, and, and really that question is here in this context is, you know, why not just use uh, water meter reading and give everybody their score based on the actual water use? And, and again, we're getting that same question on the energy side for these green rating programs. You know, why not just take the utility bills and give everybody their, their rating that way. Um, and, and I would say that the, the biggest issue to that is, um, or rather one of, the, one of the goals that we have is to develop asset ratings for buildings and homes so that um, outside of the users who are using it for a certain amount of time, the market, you know, a buyer, a seller, a realtor, a lender, um, somebody who's giving a tax incentive, um, can say, you know, this home has been designed and built from an energy or water standpoint to use this much from the average amount of users with the average amount of, um, you know, people in the, in the, in the home. And, and, you know, especially with energy, we're getting really close to getting, uh, being able to predict that pretty well. And so you just get variations if, you know, there's a, a lot more people in the house or, uh, a lot less people or, you know, something's going on with the HVAC systems. Uh, I definitely think as far as the Green Star program goes, we have a requirement that a year later utility bills be reported so we can line that up and see how that gets close to the projections. And if there's a problem, you know, we can try to work with the builder and designer and the homeowner to try to remedy that issue. So it is important to collect utility bills and you do have programs like the Living Building Challenge that actually say at the end of the day, were you zero water, were you zero energy, that's how you get your notice. But, um, you know, I, I, just looking at the utility bill alone, um, the problem there is is that there could be many different variations that year, and so that wouldn't tell the whole story of that house if it, if it turned over. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Lorraine. Yeah, I was going to say the other thing, too, since this is a predictive model, and we're talking about new homes, of course, when you go to apply for your permit, you don't have a water meter that you can read. So you, you'll need to have some sort of uh, calculation done. And, and it's pretty much the same with HERS. You know, you, you ha it's just a snapshot in time. Of course, I will share with you that we're working with a couple different water districts right now to, if they can provide us the information, we would like to run um, the homes that they have through the program and, com and compare it with their uh, with their utility meter readings, and just to kind of see what an average home might fall into. Just because there's really no way <coughs> right now to account for behavioral use, because again, you never know. Four bedroom house, there could be eight people in there. There could be two. Um, so that's one of the variables that's that's a bit tough. But we're hoping that in working with these these water districts and and existing homes that uh, we can get a little bit better idea of how close we are with the predictive model. Now, that being said, you know, there's some information that you just have to have. You have to know what the flow rates are of the fixtures. You have to know um, what the size of the home is. You have to know what the approximate landscape is in order to actually put it into the system because, you know, where, where's that water being used? You know, the water meter reading doesn't really tell you unless they've got a separate meter for irrigation, it doesn't really tell you if the use is indoor or if it's outdoor. Thanks. Um, well, we're, we're coming up with two minutes here, but, you know, we've got a lot of great questions, and uh, I have no problem sticking around. If, if, if you all want to stick around, if you can stick around, Lorene. Yeah, yeah. All right, I, yeah, I, let's, I, let's, let's keep going. So um, here's a question from John. Isn't percolation better than direct injection. This, this utilizes the natural filtration of the ground and would minimize contamination of, of the water table. What do you think? Yeah, that, that's fine too. I think we just had to have something put in that spot, whether it's percolation or, or direct injection. It's really up to the design team what they would like to do. Um, it's just that's what, that's what they do in the Southwest primarily. So. Um, 
Yeah, so if you're using the tool and your intention is to do percolation, just, you know, you can select that option um, and just let us know in the note what it is that you've done so that, uh, uh, or not let us know, but your verifier know what it is that you're doing so that when they go out to verify, um, that's the system that they see and not, not a direct injection. But I'll definitely mention it to the committee. Um, you know, about that possibility and that that should be an option or it should be clearer as to how we would define that. All right, next uh, next one. So and I think to some degree, you know, you've answered uh, a lot of this question, but um, the really I think the core of what the question is, um, is does landscape that does not require irrigation uh, get a better words index uh, or score versus irrigation? Um, not typically, um, because there is still going to be some amount of, uh, trying to think of the right word, um, hose dragging, if you will, and there'll be a little bit of usage that has to be accounted for, if that, if, if that makes sense. And so sometimes the, the hose dragging number, if you will, might be higher than the actual irrigation. And this is, um, this is something that the Irrigation Association has provided us information on at the moment. And then also, of course, working with uh, the WaterSense folks and the water budget tool, you know, trying to figure out their logic behind that. And there's actually a new standard that's just come out um, in conjunction with the Irrigation Association on the proper way to develop um, baselines. Of course, we've used some of that in the program, but these are some tighter, um, tighter standards. And of course, we don't want to necessarily develop it, but uh, we want to be able to point to that ANSI standard and say that you know this is how the outdoor baseline is being calculated. Because there there will be some sort of usage, and they're figuring on what that minimum would be in order for landscape or planting to. I can't even think of the way they describe it. So it's, it looks quasi-healthy. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. And then certainly if, uh, if, if uh, Joni, you want to chime back in with more an elaborate question on that, um, we can get to that too. Um, so here's another great question. And I was actually thinking about this too as we were going through here. Uh, and I think it's kind of speaking to uh, stormwater mitigation and using this tool to verify stormwater mitigation. The um, exact question is, re regarding recharging the water table, we often propose direction roof and hardscape rain to the on-site wetland or ponds created on-site. Would, would the uh, WERS recognize this strategy? Ooh, I like that. Um, well, right now, the only way it would recognize it is with that uh, direct injection option. Um, but that you would be using it for ponds on site. Let's see, I know we have built into the system a, um, a number that automatically creates a, a little bit of a demand based on evaporation. But uh, yeah, that, that would be a good one to see if it actually does account for that. Thanks. Uh, well, I know we're coming up on, we're past one here, but we're going to keep going with some more questions. But those of you who do have to get going and have questions about your continuing education, uh, just for sticking around the seconds you log out, you'll receive an email with the details on how you can pick up those CUs, as well as a quick survey we'd all appreciate you could take, whether you need CUs or not. We'd definitely appreciate your your feedback and response in that survey. So, Oh, I see uh, a question from Joni about Japanese rock garden. That, that does get accounted for. Um, that is, or it would be considered a, a non-vegetated uh, non softscape. So basically, that would have no water demand, but that would, that would definitely help. Um, so as far as uh, those of you logging in on the, on, the, on the Green Star side of things, you know, one of our ultimate goals here is to um, incorporate this tool as a, 
as a water performance pathway um, and, and you know, be able to allow you to use this to make better informed design. Um, at this current point in time, the tool has a requirement for what they call a water conservation plan. Um, we're actually going to be removing that and then making the WERS index um, something that you can do to help us pilot it and then pick up an extra uh, water point for doing that. And then we'll be using that data to compare it to your, your water points and seeing where we need to fit the WERS index in to the rating system as far as um, you know, bronze, silver, and gold. Um, so Lorena, on that note, um, you know, what we're doing with our teens is we're allowing them to get access to this tool and um, be able to kind of go through and explore it outside of the Raider side, more on the design side. So uh, where, yes. where can, uh, yeah, so where can, where can folks, um, where can they get, uh, where can they get access to this? How can they do that? Yeah, just shoot me an email. Um, and we'll get you into the queue because we're again it's still got some things that needs to be uh, that need to be button, buttoned up. But uh, yeah, definitely send us an email. And um, again, apologies, it's really meant for a verifier, and there might be some items in there that are irrelevant to you at this time. But at least it's it's a place to start. Yeah, and we're really really appreciative. We've had a couple pilot folks go through this and. Some of them were raiders. Some of them were just architects. And I, um, you know, I, I, Lorraine, I, you can say I think some of them have asked some pretty good questions. Oh yeah. Um, that really helped us figure out how we can fit this in. And and I kind of wanted to to bring that question up too. You know, we know a lot of these green building rating systems are moving towards a uh, performance based option. Um, just yesterday, we were doing a uh, a course on. Um, Lead for Homes version 4. If any of you know about what's going on with that tool, they've actually um, integrated a, uh, a water assessment for both indoor and outdoor performance pathway. Some of the benefits to that um, are, you know, you can, you can circumvent some of the um, prescriptive requirements of flow rates if need be. And, and the reason you might want to do that, like we have a project using V4 that, you know, has some specific challenges as far as the flow rates of the toilets and even getting down to the most basic levels to score a point in lead. But the great thing is, is on the performance metric, they could use a 1.6 gallon per flush toilet, but then make up for that water usage elsewhere on, on the performance pathway. So, you know, we see tools like lead, uh, Enterprise Green Communities in their 2015 pro program just launched another water performance pathway um, rather than prescriptive. So I guess um, besides just mentioning that, you know, my question, Lorreen, and is, you know, how, how does WERS differ um, or maybe complement some of these water tools from LEED, Green Communities, um, the WaterSense Outdoor Water Budget, or even how is it different than the Certified WaterSense New Homes Program? Yeah. Um, wow. Well, for one, you were talking about uh, the possibility of, let me see if I can share my screen again. You, you can do exactly what you described about being able to do comparisons or let, let's say hypothetically um, you want the steam shower or you want two shower heads or whatever in the uh, in the master which is which is fine you just have to compensate for it somewhere else and that's exactly what you were talking about Brett you know you'd have to uh, button down the uh, performance on something else and it's just like a, a juggling act plus um, if you've got offsets let's say hypothetically for uh, your permit in Santa Fe you have to have a WERS of at least 60 so this project, even though, well, hell, we could have, um, let's go crazy. And uh, we've got the steam shower from Kohler, you know. And they could go ahead and, and as designers and put that in because they've offset that usage with collection 
they're still under 60. So the, of course, you know, the, the, the usage goes up a bit, but, you know, they're still under the, uh, the, the performance index that was requested for permit. So there's that possibility. Now, in speaking about the water sense program, um, the main difference there, um, I know how they do their calculations, and it's an ETO average, and actually it's the peak, and it's spread out over the entire year. And when we ran some of their projects, or some of our projects through theirs, there's typically a 10 to 20,000 gallon difference. Um, and part of the, I don't know if I want to say secret, but what WERS is doing in the background, especially on the exterior, is it's really only looking at the, the months that you are really and truly going to be watering, plus it looks at each month as a separate compartment. So there isn't um, a 12-month averaging over the whole you know, year, and um, watering is only going to occur when you know, it's not freezing. So that's uh, one of the main differences. Um, did that answer your question, Brett? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, uh, I know it was a pretty, a pretty broad question, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, and I, know, I also know um, there are other water performance tools being developed, um, potentially one by uh, ResNet, perhaps. I'm not sure. Is that? Is there going to be any connection or collaboration on that? Uh, I can't really speak to that because um, I'm not really sure one where they are in the process. Um, you know, I, I do know that uh, the current version of REMRATE 15 is going to incorporate at least hot water in structural waste, but um, you know, I, I honestly don't know where they are in terms of. Um, you know their their rollout or how they're actually going to approach their their um, their tool. Okay, yeah, I just if, if some of our um, participants might have caught wind of some of that, uh, get a quick update on on where that's at. But uh, it seems like there's just overall a lot of uh, progress heading towards this idea of measuring water performance, um, similar to the way we you know, do energy. So. You know, um, I'm really excited to be, and the Green Home Institute is really excited to be collaborating with the uh, Green Builder Coalition to get the word out about these tools and get them into the hands of the raters and designers to to make better decisions. Um, but, uh, so with that, I want to I want to I, I don't see any other questions. I do want to wrap the webinar up here for those of you listening live. Your continuing education will be emailed to you. Uh, if you don't see it, check your spam. It should be in there. Uh, for those of you online um, watching on demand, make sure to take your quiz at the end of this to get your continuing education units. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Lorene from the Green Builder Coalition, as well as um, Mike, whose name is up there but could be present today for all of their work in putting this together. I encourage you guys to reach out to them, ask more questions, attend some more of the sessions. Uh, this session will be recorded and made available. Um, Lorene, where can uh, again, where can they find your contact information? Um, it should be up on the screen. Okay. Yeah. So lb at greenbuildercoalition.org. Reach out to her for more questions. And thanks again, everybody. Take care. All right. Cool.